Dear Jason, Here is my letter for public comment to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. You asked me to write you a letter, but my story can only be told with pictures. The Great Salt Lake is important to me because that's where I fell in love with my husband. We go horseback riding there with our children and enjoy the birds and wildlife. Many of the birds that visit the Great Salt Lake have second homes in other countries. The planet needs to know this story too, since your decision will impact them as well. You asked me to write to you to tell you what the alternatives are. The only alternative is to keep the lake as it is, as natural as possible. The natural beauty and wildlife habitat is what makes the Great Salt Lake valuable. Since you said that you didn't think that enough people have had the chance to comment, I decided to show the world your public notice and explain what it means. You are the one who decides if this area gets destroyed or not. Please protect this unique resource. In 2009, Great Salt Lake Minerals uh, proposed a 91,000 acre expansion on Great Salt Lake. Great Salt Lake Minerals is a mineral extraction company that produces, among other things, potash and, uh, and salt, road salt, for instance. And the state has since approved the leasing uh, necessary for this expansion. And now the uh, company is, uh, has applied to the Army Corps of Engineers for a 404 permit that will allow this expansion to go forward. The Army Corps of Engineers is, as you know, a federal agency and their role is to process what's called a 404 permit. Uh, it uh, falls under the auspices of the Clean Water Act and it is a dredge and fill permit. So uh, anytime that a wetland is disturbed uh, to a certain extent, the Army Corps of Engineers has to issue a permit. There's a coalition of conservation-minded citizens from all walks of life that are concerned about the impacts that this expansion is going to have on the resources of Great Salt Lake. And we pray for the state legislators who write the laws and commit the resources for our parks. Almighty God, in the course of this busy life, give us times of refreshment and peace and grant that we may so use our leisure to rebuild our bodies and renew our minds, that our spirits may be open to the goodness of your creation. Keep us from harm's way. Fill us with the love of each other as you have loved and blessed us with your creative spirit. Bless us with favorable winds and following seas. These things we pray in Christ's name, amen. It's valuable, I think, in a lot of different ways. Uh, first of all, from a sailing perspective, it's, it's the greatest sailing around. But I think another value is just its aesthetic value. I mean, it is the uh, namesake for Salt Lake City. Anywhere around the valley uh, where you can see it, it's, it's out there, it's shining, it uh, sort of identifies the, the whole area and uh, I think it has great value in that respect. Since 1962, the Department of Natural Resources has accommodated business, industry, and agriculture. They have repeatedly approved permits for companies to extract minerals from sovereign lands held in public trust in and around the Great Salt Lake. The state of Utah's Department of Natural Resources is the governing agency responsible for approving this 91,000 acre expansion for the benefit of Great Salt Lake Minerals Corporation. The Department of Natural Resources exists to ensure that the natural resources in Utah are used in ways that will make them last 
and remain for future generations. The current Department of Natural Resources Executive Director is Michael R. Styler. He reports to the Governor of the State of Utah, Gary R. Herbert. Even though scientists from the Department of Natural Resources have stated that the Great Salt Lake is a fragile ecosystem, by repeatedly approving these leases, the Department of Natural Resources is placing the Great Salt Lake at risk. In March 2012, the Utah Department of Natural Resources released the final draft of the Great Salt Lake Comprehensive Management Plan and Mineral Leasing Plan. The newly released plan opened up almost the entire west side of the Great Salt Lake for possible mineral leasing. The new plan encourages the use of appropriate areas for the extraction of brines, minerals, chemicals, and petrochemicals, and encourages the development of an integrated industrial complex. We need to change the laws that encourage industrial expansion on the Great Salt Lake. Right now, there are very few areas on the Great Salt Lake that are protected. There's companies been dumping into this lake and been using this lake and trying to control this lake and 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 the government's trying to control this lake, you know, the lake levels and stuff since the white man moved in. Until industry gets so big out here like the GSL Minerals wants to do right now where they they can actually tell you how much they're going to drain the lake and that's scary. Because we got companies like MagCorp and and uh, Morton Salt and a couple other salt companies, and and they all evaporate water. The Great Salt Lake began as Lake Bonneville. At its largest, it covered about 20,000 square miles of western Utah and smaller portions of eastern Nevada and southern Idaho. The Great Salt Lake is a terminal lake with no outlet rivers running to the ocean. Since water leaves the lake only through evaporation. It leaves behind its dissolved minerals, making the lake much saltier than seawater. The lake is shrinking because of the water used by industry, irrigation, and humans. You can see in this picture the Great Salt Lake used to cover a larger surface area and was deeper. Now it is smaller and more shallow. If you keep taking water out of the Great Salt Lake and prevent water from getting into it, the lake will shrink substantially. The Great Salt Lake is fed by three main tributaries, the Jordan River, the Ogden River, and the most important one, the Bear River, which provides 60% of the water that runs in from the rivers. It gets 50% of its water from direct precipitation and 50% from spring runoff through the rivers. The Great Salt Lake is artificially divided by the Union Pacific Railroad Causeway, creating the North Arm and the South Arm. There are also hundreds of miles of dikes that have already been built within the high water mark of the Great Salt Lake to create evaporation ponds. The natural water flow of the Great Salt Lake has been destroyed by dissecting the lake with these dikes and causeways. The entire lake will be affected by the expansions, water usage, and building of new dikes. Stansbury Bay, Kleiman Bay, Gunnison Bay, and Bear River Bay will be the most affected by the 91,000 acre expansion. Operations they have in Bear River Bay are gravity fed. They're not complex operations, but there are approximately 90 ponds uh, as part of that. And they're all gravity fed. Uh, so the dikes have to be of a certain height so that water will flow from one to the other. So they pump the water up to the north end and then it's, it gravity flows down through the different ponds. And the processing is again quite simple different minerals fall out at different percentages of, uh, of concentration. And so um, basically they move it from one pond to the other and capture the minerals that they want. And then eventually they flush the remainder back into Bear River Bay down towards the railroad causeway at the south end of their operations. They flush four and a half million tons of salt a year uh, into uh, back into the lake into what is rel a relatively fresh part of the lake. So yes, it absolutely impacts it. Now, how much to, and to what degree? We don't know. Uh, that's one of the things that we've asked for is a study of how that flushing operation impacts the bay. And um, so far we've been denied that request. Basically what their expansion 91,000 acres on the entire Great Salt Lake and 8,000 of those acres would be within Bear River Bay. 
Right now we have between five and eight million waterfowl and shorebirds on the lake at any given time. Many of them stop in Bear River Bay because of its shallow sheet flow and its shallow water that's there. Sometimes it's only six inches deep and sometimes it gets up to maybe a foot. But it still is shallow enough and it's calm enough that these birds can nest and forage for food. And so if Great Salt Lake Minerals were to put their expansion ponds in, if they went from that northernmost point of their dike and went out into the bay and then down, as they proposed to do, that would actually take the water flow that's currently there coming out of the Willard Spur. It would then come in contact with the dike that's already there, which creates, it would, it would funnel it into a deeper, faster flow area and the birds wouldn't have that shallow sheet water anymore. There's not another place on the lake like this, and so you, you could never replace this area. Well, my name is Scott Saxton, and uh, my son, Parker, is working on his Eagle Project. I happen to be a scout master and some of the scouts that are behind us there are, are some of our troop that are earning uh, hours of service towards their rank advancement. Our project uh, today is, uh, we've been working on for the last couple of weeks, so we're building uh, geese nests. Uh, there's a real problem out in the area in the Bear River Bird Refuge where there used to be a lot of geese that used the area. but they're not using the area like they used to. And we're hoping with these geese nests that we can put out there that will give them a sense of security that they'll start using the area again for their nesting. You know where they are? They're along the grass islands and stuff out there, so go ahead and do those. Um, we also need to, need to know who has room in their boats because and who doesn't have a ride. If what I want is if you don't have a ride on a boat for sure right now, Please come here right now. The Utah Airboat Association uses this area quite a bit. We uh, we hunt out here for ducks and geese. We have parties out here in the summer where we have cookouts. We have obstacle courses. We have members that come out here and bird watch. We have some uh, people that come out here and bow fish off their boats uh, with their bows and arrows. We come out here in the spring and we put out uh, duck and goose nests. And uh, then we uh, come out in the fall and make sure that the nests all have grass in them and make sure you know, if birds are using them, make sure they're okay. And we just do just a lot of stuff like that. We come around here and, and really enjoy the, this area. The Airboat Association, every year we have a nesting project out here on the Spur of Willard. And as members, we come out and we take our boats. It just gives us one more opportunity to drive our boats together. And we go out and we put up goose boxes and duck nests and stuff. And we stuff them every year with grass so that it gives the birds a place to nest up off the ground so the predators can't eat the babies. You know, I think the thing that I like the most is it's just something that not everybody gets to see. When we get out there on the marsh, it's just peaceful. We're away from the hustle and bustle, you know, and the ecosystem that's out there in the marsh is just, it's really, it's neat to be out there and be a part of that environment. So as the Airboat Association, I mean, one of our big goals is to make sure that the marsh is always protected. We fight not only in Congress and in legislation, but we fight out here on the marsh to keep things good and, and I mean it's something that we all hold pretty dear to our hearts. Not necessarily keepers of the marsh but we want to you know be the wardens of the marsh and make sure that things stay the way they are and, and that this is here for future generations like my kids and my grandkids and everybody else and that's why we dedicate the time and money that we do. It's people wanting to damage and destroy the marsh. They just think that it doesn't matter that it's just there to do whatever they want to with it and I mean, that's why we fight like we do to keep it the way it is, as natural as we possibly can keep it. We fought a bill in legislation this year. They wanted to raise phosphorus level in discharge water out of sewer plants. And if they do that, that'll create algae blooms on the top of the water. And when that algae blooms on top of the water, nothing can grow underneath it. And then so when these birds are coming through here, all of the wildlife, shorebirds, waterfowl, they won't have anything to eat. 
they'll just have to move on and then we'll miss all of that, that opportunities. I mean, during the year, through the migration period, we'll have millions upon millions of birds migrate through here and it changes daily. We can come out one day and see a ton of avocets and come out the very next day and they're gone and there's something new in the marsh. I mean, it's just amazing at how many birds fly through this marsh. Where we are now is we're floating uh, in Bear River Bay and we're almost in the center of the, uh, of the area that uh, GSL Minerals wants to expand out into. Um, to the east of us is uh, Willard Spur. Uh, Willard Spur uh, comes in from the east side, uh, Willard Bay area, uh, Harold Crane, the Bear, Bear River Bird Refuge. All the water comes into there. It uh, kind of necks down with a big sandbar to the east of us and then it, that, that's kind of the defining boundary between Willard Spur and Bear River Bay. And this, unfortunately, because of irrigation demands upstream on the Bear River, uh, this Bear River doesn't make it out to the, doesn't flow to the Great Salt Lake anymore. It's, uh, so this area here, a lot of times, over the last, like the last decade or so, has gone completely dry. And uh, that's, that's sad because the birds really need it, but on the other hand, in the fall when the irrigation stops and they let water come back out here again, it all starts growing again, and uh, so it's, it's a viable food source again. But in the summer, sometimes it can be really dry, really dusty, and uh, until, as long as they keep uh, issuing more and more water permits for very little water available, it's going to go dry out here, and there's really nothing we can do about it. GSL Minerals already has 22,000 acres in Bear River Bay. They've already diked off. They want 8,000 acres more, and that makes about 30,000 acres of Bear River Bay gone and this bay is the last freshwater bay left on the lake it's the last pristine freshwater area for wildlife migratory birds to enjoy and to use and they want to destroy it it'll be gone well gsl minerals has has proposed uh, that maybe they could change out the plan a little bit and they could say we'll take maybe 20,000 acres on the west side and maybe 8,000 acres on the east side and we'll do it incrementally over the course of the next 20 years and they're looking for ways to make it seem more palatable to the citizens of Utah, I guess. But the end result is the same. We lose prime wildlife area, prime um, boating areas, hunting areas, bow fishing areas. The end result will always be the same. It's, it's gone. If their permits were to be approved for the entire 91,000 acres on the entire lake, that's a 194% increase over their current operations. And really how much fertilizer can the world use? A lot of this stuff um, goes to almond growers, a lot of fruit growers use this as fertilizer. Um, but another interesting thing is that uh, a lot of the uh, organic gardeners and stuff have kind of jumped on the bandwagon to use potash for their fertilizer. And a lot of them purchase the products from GSL Minerals. GSL Minerals touts this stuff as an organic um, fertilizer, you know, that, that's good for the world. So you have people like, uh, um, I think it's Dr. Earth and a few other um, really nice companies that are trying to do their best to do organic gardening and things like that are ending up buying materials from a company that is destroying thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of wetlands and bird habitat in order to make an organic product. So there's a kind of a tough trade-off there where do you want to do the right thing and get organic fer fertilizer but destroy 30 extra thousand acres of wetlands that wildlife depend on? That's a tough, that's a tough call. And so far business wins. I know that there is a reason for a company to be in business, but I also know that what they're talking about doing is going to devastate this lake. Not just from my standpoint, which it could very easily put me out of business if they take the water out that they're talking about taking out, but they're going to create more issues with uh, dust storms. With the, uh, this, this lake bottom is very heavily saturated with heavy metals, and uh, every time the shore line is exposed, whether it's by Mother Nature, like it has been the last few years, and the wind comes up and that turns into dust, that creates a health hazard for everybody in the Salt Lake Valley. It's hard to quantify 
the amount of toxicity, in particular heavy metals, in the Great Salt Lake. But what we do know is that testing by the U.S. Geological Survey revealed that there are higher concentrations of mercury in the Great Salt Lake than any other inland body of water in the entire United States. And in many respects, probably many times higher, maybe as much as 35 times higher. So uh, what exactly that means, we're not sure, but it can't be good given the intense toxicity of mercury, given the fact that it's going to be deposited in the sediment of the lake, given the fact that we're setting ourselves up for having a smaller lake and we're letting industry drain water out of the lake, we can be well assured that the toxic dust that will be created as a result of this will contain mercury and other heavy metals in it. And that's not a good thing. Uh, problems that we've had, you know, um, the, the issue with mercury poison. We have advisories on several duck species that use the lake here, uh, telling people that if they are a hunter and they harvest them, not to eat them. Well, I know that, uh, you know, our, our guys, our Airboat Association, guys, we shoot a lot of birds out there. We shoot a lot of teal. And uh, I know your association, Mud Motor Association, those guys shoot a lot too. Sure. So, um, you worried? Because uh, I know we have a mercury advisory. Yeah, well, I mean, we're, of course we're concerned. I mean, we've got, you know, obviously our association with the Mud Motor Association, we, we you know, harvested a fair amount of birds, and especially the three that are on that, uh, that, uh, that notice, the Northern Shoveler, the Common Golden Eye, and the, the Cinnamon Teal. You know, shoot, I've talked to a lot of our members, and, you know, they, they just choose not to, not to harvest those birds just simply because of that warning. And it's, that's, that's sad, you know, when, when you really look at it, you go out for the quality experience and, and maybe you don't have a whole lot of opportunities, a lot of the other ducks. Um, and you have to pass, you know, whether you have to or you should, you pass on those, those opportunities. And it's, again, it just takes away from that quality experience, which is sad. B besides those three birds, the golden eye, the cinnamon teal and the shoveler, I mean, it stands to reason that there are other birds out there eating these brine shrimp. We have the brine shrimp bioaccumulating mercury. We have other ducks that we shoot and eat a lot of, which are the green wing teal. Um, I, it's scary that why aren't those things listed? And I'll bet they are. It stands to reason that those are getting to be the point where it could be dangerous too. And, and we don't know where the mercury is coming from. They, no one can figure it out exactly. It could be coming from industry pollutants. It could be coming from uh, the exposed lake bed. Uh, when heavy metals blow off when in the when the winds off the desert or off the lake beds and it's all coming to us eventually and it's scary and we don't know where it's coming from. Mercury is probably on the order of a thousand times more toxic to the brain than lead is and yet the amount of exposure that people in my generation grew up with by virtue of the lead allowed in gasoline studies probably estimate that the amount of IQ that we all lost because we grew up in that area might be as much as five to seven points. That's a game changer. That's a career changer. And if the amount of lead we were exposed to has that profound an effect and mercury is that much more toxic, then that certainly amplifies the message that we can't tolerate an environment where lead and mercury, arsenic, et cetera, et cetera, are continually plastered into our environment. And if we continue to allow industries to drain and divert water from the Great Salt Lake, that problem will become more and more acute. Once a year, Great Salt Lake Minerals extracts brine from the North Arm, pumps it into Climbing Bay, and concentrates it just a little bit more than it is in the North Arm. The reason they do that is so that they can put it into the Barron's Trench and transport it from Climbing Bay to Bear River Bay. And they do that through a gravity system. So the uh, brine from Climbing Bay has to be just a little bit heavier and a little bit denser than the ambient brine in the North Arm. So that's why they do that. This is a yearly process. They pump water in, they transport it over to Bear River Bay, and then they empty the ponds um, so that they can bring in fresh water each spring. Evaporation only occurs during summer months and then they'll process what they have already and then they'll begin again next spring. They have about 21, 22,000 acres of pond in Climbing Bay now. What they're proposing is about 
72,000 acres additional on that side of the lake. So if you want to compare, you know, it's, it's triple the size of their current operations or actually a little bit more than that. Uh, and in terms of the amount of water they're going to pull out, uh, 353,000 acre feet is a tremendous amount of water. It's about three times what they're using now. They have made um, assertions you know, to different groups that they plan to use less water, but we haven't seen any final figures. So we have to go with what's in front of the state engineer now, and that's the 353,000 acre feet. The shoreline will basically be contained within the, uh, their proposed expansion. So whatever shoreline currently exists uh, will be subsumed within that expansion. So it'll no longer exist. So uh, I, they won't go beyond the shoreline, but they will encompass the shoreline and then they'll go out into the lake. So basically you will lose all that shoreline for those miles uh, north of Climbing Bay all the way to north of Dolphin Island. Uh, where that uh, expansion is, is going to end. So it's, it's, it's a big impact on the shoreline. It just will be gone. What they will do is they will bring in fill and they will build up a dike. It's much wider at the bottom than it is at the top. Um, some of it will settle, so they'll continue to bring in. They'll drive trucks over it until, it's, until it firms up. Uh, the railroad uh, wanted to build a shortcut um, to cut off some of the distance that it used to travel uh, around uh, what was called Lucin. So they come up with the idea of building the railroad causeway. The original causeway was a trestle style that allowed the uh, exchange of water because of the open design of the trestle. Uh, later, uh, the Union Pacific Railroad uh, put in a different style of uh, causeway, which is now uh, a mass of um, earth and rock and so forth, so there's no interchange. And then later, uh, there were a couple breaches made to try to create some interchange, not enough. Um, nor, more needs to be done, uh, but hasn't been done because of the cost involved, and the railroad is not willing to go to that cost. And we haven't been able to put together enough political will to create that change also. And so over time, um, that part of the lake is becoming non-productive. Matter of fact, you can fly over that area and you can see algae blooms. So the water's pink because of the microbes that live here, the bacteria that and archaea that live in the water and some of the algae species have pigments in their cell membranes. And the pigments are very related to the kinds of pigments you see in fall leaves or in carrots. You know, before the, the causeway, before that time it was one lake. And after the causeway was built, because of the water flow um, being, uh, being all uh, in the south arm and very limited uh, freshwater inflow to the north arm, because of that, um, it's now really two lakes at one location. And this north arm um, just keeps getting saltier and saltier um, as time goes on, and it's at saturation most of the time, meaning the water's holding as much salt as it can. I don't think at this point uh, it will be possible uh, to remove the causeway. To improve the causeway is a different matter. Currently, the railroad has a proposal to replace its culverts, which are non-functioning with a bridge, which will have some positive impact on the flow between the north and the south arm. Um, but how much 
difference that will make, we don't know. Other than that, it's a very complicated question. The, um, the railroad lives by a different set of rules. Uh, they basically, um, I don't want to say they do what they want, but... The brine shrimp industry is a big important industry for the birds as well as for some uh, in business that harvest the brine shrimp eggs for the aquarium trade uh, and for the prawn industry. And, and some parts of the lake, like the north end of the lake, north of the um, railroad causeway, are no longer producing brine shrimp because there's no turnover of body of water throughout the seasons as it once did because the causeway now doesn't have enough breaches in it to allow that interchange of water. There are a whole host of um, birds that use the brine shrimp as a, as a food source. Um, avocets as an example, uh, phalaropes uh, another example, golden eye that come here in winter use the brine shrimp as a, as a food source, and, and a variety of other birds as, as well that will feed on those invertebrates and such. Uh, but those birds no longer use that section of the lake because there's no more food available for them. So now they're more massed and concentrated in other sections of the lake that still produce the shrimp, which in itself is somewhat risky as you get so many birds concentrated in areas like that. And from time to time, we'll have uh, botulism outbreaks where you have massive die-offs because of that bacteria that's been developed in that area. Now you have this mass of birds that are all concentrated in there that spread that disease amongst one another. So there, there are a lot of hazards when you have those types of situations. People along the Wasatch Front really um, don't value the lake and to the degree that they should. Um, most people, if you went and you interviewed people on the street and asked them what they thought about the lake, a lot of them would say it's a buggy, stinky place, um, you know, they've never been out there or maybe they went out when they were a kid and they've not been back. The lake has an unfortunate reputation as being a dead sea and it's, it's far from that. Uh, you know, millions and millions of birds use that lake every year. Uh, people love the lake, but the state is driven by money and these decisions uh, are being made by politicians who do not value uh, the, uh, the natural resources that we have in our own backyard and would basically they give the nod to uh, extraction over, over those resources. These dikes will decrease bird populations in the entire western hemisphere. The birds need someone to stand up and say no to future industrial expansions on the lake. Well if they change the ecosystem I don't know if you're aware of all of the the birds that migrate through here but also Great Salt Lake was the one of the first migratory bird refuges in the United States and we have thousands and thousands of birds. I mean I'll go out in the, the fall and the springtime and there are hundreds of grebes out there. Uh, it's just it's a beautiful place. The birds uh, out here are incredible. There's so many species. It's and there's so many species that uh, this is a very critical body of water to them. Um, I, I've heard upwards of 75% uh, of some species uh, nest and uh, use the lake either in migration or as their home. I teach a bird observation and behavior class at the University of Utah. Uh, the classes are usually really small and maybe um, 15 people and I take them to different places to watch birds. And these are people who've never really thought about birds before. Most of the people who take the class are seniors who have one more credit left in order to graduate and they, they want an easy class and so they take my class and we go out and we look at birds. We go to Farmington Bay and we look at the birds on Glover Pond and um, the students just, their, their, their jaws just drop because they've never seen more than one kind of duck before in one place or they've never seen avocets or 
uh, stilts or pelicans or cormorants. They have no idea. And they see this diversity on the lake and they just go, wow, we just never even knew. Uh, that's one of the evaluation things that always comes back is like, we never knew that there were birds like this in some place like this. There are two or three things that are really, really make the Great Salt Lake important to migratory birds. Uh, one is its location. It sits above the equator, about 42 degrees of latitude. And that puts it in a situation where it is between the equator, uh, almost an equal distance, as it is from the Arctic Rim. So birds that are going to nest in the Arctic, like uh, redneck phalaropes, would be traveling to the lake about half the distance from where they would be wintering. The other thing is like an oasis in a desert, large saline lake in an otherwise arid Zurich environment. Birds don't have many other places to go, especially if they're traveling in large numbers. They need to put on body fat for fuel for to continue their migration from a resource that doesn't take them a lot of time and energy to forage that resource. So a third element that's important to the lake is in terms of migratory species is the size of the lake. It's the fourth largest saline lake in the world. The lake elevations are at the long-term historic average of 4,200 feet above sea level is 1,500 square miles. And then you have a, an association with that because of the Wasatch Mountains and the Uinta Mountains in the backdrop, um, a pretty rich uh, drainage system that feeds this arid system from an oasis perspective that trickles through and, and aggregates in these large complexes of wetlands. So we have large systems of aquatic freshwater wetlands in association with a saline lake. That size, with that volume of uh, water and that, those large numbers, 400,000 acres of wetlands, provides a foraging resource for these birds, especially birds that are aggregate in large numbers. One thing that's unique about Great Salt Lake when birders come here is they're amazed at the numbers of birds that they see. It isn't just one or two hopping along the side of the road or along the beach. It's, it's a lot of birds flying and, and eating and just gorging themselves at the cafeteria that the Great Salt Lake truly is. We organize our field trips for Great Salt Lake Bird Festival. We have a subcommittee chair and that committee chair knows who the birders are, the, who the uh, top-notch birders are for the state of Utah, and they come and guide for us during bird festival. Okay, we got Mallard, Coot, Gadwall, Forster's Turn, Double Crest of Cormorant, White Pelican, Clark's Grebe, Western Grebe, Pied-billed Grebe, Beard Grebe, Barn Swallow, Gadwall, Black neck stilt, American Avocet, Longville Dowager. That's your 360 bird report. Anything else? The effect on birds from, from these development concerns um, could be in the availability of nesting grounds. There, there's only so much part of the lake that's really available for, for birds to use. The inflows of fresh water are very important because of the kind of life that can live in brackish water and because of the kind of plant life that can live in those places as well. That's part of what makes the, the Great Salt Lake such a wonderful place for birds right now is, is the mix between fresh water and salt water. Well, there are a large number of birds that are associated with the Great Salt Lake, but there are maybe 10 to 15 species where the lake plays either a really important local, regional, or hemispheric role, and in some cases, a world population role 
and their conservation. The best example of a bird that's reliant on the Great Salt Lake would be the eared grebe. Eared grebes nest in freshwater environments on top of matted vegetation in small colonies. And uh, when they're here, they go through a body, body mold of feathers and a wing molt, which makes them flightless, which means they can escape, and they're foraging on brine shrimp adults at that time. So if we don't sustain the brine shrimp adult population, and the numbers that are important, the densities that are important to, to them to, to go through their physiological ch changes and needs, then it, we could be in jeopardy for that species. <laughs> And today we're celebrating Eagle Day at Great Salt Lake in northern Utah. And a big group of people gathered today to enjoy these beautiful birds, They're our national symbol, the bald eagle. Uh, we have large concentrations of eagles that come specifically here to Farmington Bay to exploit the carp that are available for them now at this time of the year. And so they can feed on a smorgasbord of fish and utilize them and people get to see a beautiful group of birds. And the Wild Bird Center, I bring people out Every Saturday we go somewhere throughout Utah to enjoy birds and show them um, a variety of natural wonders through birds and help them get focused on nature and, uh, and how important it is to protect places like this. So this is a real neat way to show people um, the, how they can make uh, something happen. My name is June Ryburn and I volunteer for the Division of Wildlife also volunteer for the Great Salt Lake Audubon Society and we're interested in promoting nature and we come here um, the Division of Wildlife probably is at least probably 10 events a year showcasing what other creature is available to see fairly close and get people out and enjoy nature and if you enjoy nature you're going to want to protect it and it needs to be protected. The Great Salt Lake is recognized as a site of hemispheric importance under the network of the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network. That was based on the Wilson's Phalarope, where over 500,000 Wilson's Phalaropes can come through the Great Salt Lake. But there are many other bird species like blackneck stilt and American avocet that are shorebirds that use the lake, as well as waterfowl and uh, tundra swans, uh, American white pelicans, and so forth. There are 21 uh, important bird areas uh, throughout the state of Utah. We have five globally important bird areas on the Great Salt Lake. Uh, Gilbert Bay, which is a globally important bird area, and the four others are Farmington Bay, uh, Ogden Bay, Bear River Bay, and Gunnison Bay. Gunnison Bay is a globally important bird area primarily because of Gunnison Island, which has the third or fourth largest American white pelican colony in the United States and is the only area where American white pelicans uh, nest in the state of Utah at this time. So the pelicans that, um, that live here on Gunnison Island, which is just past the sight line of Spiral Jetty here, um, they come in March. We always appreciate them coming over, watching our research on the microorganisms while we're here. Uh, they always visit us and fly over and give us a nice show. Um, but it, it is a, a, a very important breeding colony, and I think they probably benefit from the North Arm being so isolated and desolate because they like to nest where they are not bothered. Gunnison Island is a pelican rookery, one of the few remaining uh, rookeries for American white pelicans in the United States. So the reason it's a rookery is because it's so isolated and the pelicans uh, can nest in peace. Uh, one of the dangers of this proposal is that Great Salt Lake Minerals will extract so much water it will create a land bridge out from the shore to uh, Gunnison Island. If you create a land bridge, then um, it doesn't matter how close they are. Uh, in fact, their dikes could be used for predators to travel out even closer to the island. So as part of the stipulation that is being proposed for their expansion, uh, they would get no closer than three miles to Gunnison Island. Now some, some would say that's a sufficient distance, but three miles um, in an area where sound carries uh, very 
easily over great distances is not much of a, a buffer. Predators such as coyotes will be able to make their way out to the island and disturb the, the rookery. Once that occurs, it's likely the pelicans will abandon that. I don't think the destruction is worth it. I think that Gunnison Island is a very special place. Uh, it's very unique and the birds use it for that reason. And there are very few places in the world that are like it that they can use instead. If that goes away, there's not an alternative. You know, on the, on the evaporation ponds, it, it really does impact our birds. It's taking away resting areas. You know, the same places where we're evaporating that stuff is the same place that the birds like to rest. Um, and the Great Salt Lake is, is right in the middle of that Pacific Flyway. Every bird comes through there, so it's impacting them. On when we're talking about taking over, what, 91,000 acres? Yeah, but to, to be able to do that on an entire body of water, how many thousands of animals are out in that one space that are going to be displaced because of commercialism? You know, granted, they'll still, they'll still use the water, you know, but uh, you know, what kind of chemicals are going to be in it? What kind of you know, concentrations of things that might be harmful in, in high concentrations are going to be out there? You know, what kind of boats and, and extraction stuff are going to be having to go through there? You know, there's great big rest areas out there that when you, when you go out there, you'll see hundreds of thousands of birds in one tight, confined space. You know, there's nowhere else for them to go because all of the other habitats that's been taken away. 25, 30 years ago when they were when they were talking about this same thing where people were saying hey you shouldn't maybe you shouldn't uh, dike in all this marsh but the GSL Minerals said no no this will be great we'll make a lot of money for the the state and the county and, and it'll even be even better for wetlands and wildlife. Um, so we had almost the same debate going on and money won. Uh, they bring in a lot of money to the to the local governments through income income taxes from their uh, employees, they make money from uh, corporate taxes, um, you know, there's a lot of money to be made and when you have wildlife habitat versus big business, it's tough to, it's tough to compete against big business. Basically, why do they allow something like this to go forward? Again, they're not in the business of uh, disapproving uh, a proposal like this. This goes to the very heart of well, the question is, is how should these resources be used? So Great Salt Lake is a sovereign land and it is um, to be held in, in what we call public trust. So the state agency, the Division of Forestry, Fires and State Lands is required by statute and by their regulations to protect uh, the public trust resources for the people of the state. We, the taxpayers, own these resources. The Division of Forestry, Fires, and State Lands is the trustee that is tasked to overlook those resources, to protect those resources. Unfortunately, the state looks at mineral extraction uh, as, a, um, as a revenue source. And so the state is willing to trade money for protecting these resources. Clearly we disagree with that perception, but all we can do is uh, challenge that decision and ultimately the state makes that decision. We have a vote, but it's, uh, it's a small one. And so this is ultimately a political position and a political decision. And it's the policymakers of the state uh, who declare that uh, the state is open for business for resource extraction. And until that changes, these decisions will continue to be made. The politicians who have historically run the state of Utah as a group don't seem to have much appreciation for the uh, potential for industrial activity to cause serious public health harm. And of course, this is true with the industrial activity that is currently allowed on the lake. We know that the sediment of the lake has high concentrations of heavy metals, mercury in particular, and anything that's out there that's going to increase the uh, dry beach area is going to increase the amount of heavy metal exposure that the public's going to experience. Yes, they should have a much greater appreciation than they do for what those consequences are, but this, that's just one of many examples where our, our government and it certainly isn't just state government, but local governments as well, aren't as informed about the issues as they should be, 
but even when they are, they tend to be suspicious about the claims made by public health advocates, and they generally seem to have a bias of whatever's good for industry has got to be good for the public, and they tend to d dismiss a lot of the things, a lot of the concerns that we try and present them with because they just can't see through the fog of whatever's good for business has got to be good for all of us. And taking the resources without consideration of how it affects the ecosystem, the minerals being taken out of it, or structures being built that change the natural habitat and uh, may affect the outcomes of the wildlife and, and the waterfowl that use the area. We support between five and eight million waterfowl and 1.4 million shorebirds every year that come here. We have over 250 different species. What's really fascinating is that 80% of all wildlife require the wetlands at some point in time in their lifetime. Well, mitigation is an option. That's one of the, uh, we don't know how the company uh, proposes to mitigate these impacts. How do you mitigate for 91,000 acres of Great Salt Lake? And as far as we can tell, there, there really is no acceptable mitigation. Well, that territory where the Great Salt Lake Minerals is, is operating now and where they want to expand varies from open water in Bear Bay to pristine beaches on the west side of the lake to what was formerly playas and uh, Salicornia Flats. And this is built up into flat, sandy, and muddy bottoms for over the course of thousands of years. That's, that's, the, way it, that's the way nature intended it to be. All those, the ecosystem has evolved to survive in that. If they try to mitigate this by spreading out those dikes, it's gonna be just a bunch of rocks spread out by bulldozers. It's not the same, and it won't ever be the same. When I was with Great Salt Lake Audubon, we had a member of our board who was, um, his work is in that industry and in the minerals industry. And one thing that he said that I thought was really very interesting was if they don't do this, if they're not allowed to do this, we'll just go somewhere else. We'll go to Severe Lake and take out leases on Severe Lake, which is mostly a dry lake bed, but still has water in it sometimes. And um, now we'll endanger this lake system instead of this lake system. Or we'll go to Mexico or Argentina, where the labor is very cheap and there are no laws to protect their resources. Um, so uh, the truth of the matter is, We've, we've got this enormous mouth to feed. And it's saying, feed me, give me minerals. I want them, I'm gonna take them from wherever I'm gonna get them. And maybe what we have to do is think about how we use them. And maybe we don't need to use so much. Maybe we don't need to put so much fertilizer on our lawns. Maybe we don't need to do four loads of laundry a week. You know, you know maybe there are ways that we can use fewer resources like the minerals in our lakes. This is something we need to protect uh, for future generations and uh, anything short of that is just not acceptable. You know I have grandchildren and I want my grandchildren to be able to go out and have that same experience and to be able to uh, enjoy what what I've had the privilege of enjoying and it's it's going to take all of us to uh, to fight for that because the The state will continue to approve expansion of these type of facilities on the lake until we all stand up and say enough. And that's what we're trying to do is say enough. If enough people care and tell their elected officials, and that, that means the mayor of the town, that means your county commissioner, that means your, your state legislature, legislator, your state senator, these people need to know that this area has value and that you, as a citizen, want some natural areas to, to remain and not be destroyed, that's the very best way to do that. Contact everybody you know, make your voice known. If nobody says anything, they'll take this and it'll, they'll, they'll destroy it. There's no way to mitigate it. There's no way to recreate what is gone, what is lost, that has been here for eons, long before humans, and has supported life for decades and centuries 
how do you justify as a human being to take that away? This area, this lake here, my Great Salt Lake and your Great Salt Lake is such a dynamic ecosystem. It's, it, it's on the international map. We're part of the Pacific Flyway with the birds during their migrational period and it's a globally important bird area. These are areas that we should be protecting and saving for our future generations so that they see what, what's here. If it's gone, it's just lost. I mean, it's our job to protect this lake. She can't speak for herself. And so I feel like it's my job to speak up for her. We have the ability to see what we're doing that causes things to happen. And we can make decisions that change that course. Learn about the lake, um, go to the lake, see it, um, smell it, uh, look at the birds that use it, um, fall in love with it, and understand that it's more than just a big stinky bathtub out there. It's, it's really a unique resource that is depended upon by millions of creatures tens of millions of creatures. You want to include us in that, and birds, and insects, and they all depend on that lake being as it is. And that, that's staggering, you know. And if you believe that, and are passionate about that, there are ways that you can make a difference in keeping it that way. These local groups oppose the Great Salt Lake Minerals Corporation 91,000 acre expansion project. We are calling on everyone, including all members of these organizations, to take a few minutes to submit a letter to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to let your voice be heard. Written comments referencing Public Notice SPK-2007-00121 must be submitted to Jason Gibson, Project Manager, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, 533 West, 2600 South, Suite 150, Bountiful, Utah, 84010. Email jason.a.gibson at usace.army.mil. Please write two letters to Jason, one now and one after the draft environmental impact statement is released for public comment later this year. Please let Laura and the Department of Natural Resources know that their plan is not acceptable. In your letter, be specific about the areas on the map that are now proposed for possible mineral leasing. If this plan gets approved, the majority of the Great Salt Lake will be available for extraction. We do not need to compromise this critical habitat for the extraction of minerals. We need to be the voice for the Great Salt Lake. For more information and updates about the Great Salt Lake, go to our Facebook page, Evaporating Shorelines, and our website, backlightpictures.com. You can email us at greatsaltlakestory at gmail.com. You can also visit the Friends of Great Salt Lake website.